Okay, welcome along to today's uh, webinar entitled Occupational Noise, Hand Arm Vibration and Whole Body Vibration. It's just gone 11 o'clock um, and we're going to start right away. Okay, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Dermot Keeney. Uh, my company is ICANN Acoustics. We're located at www.acoustics.ie. Uh, I hold an MSc in Applied Acoustics from the University of Derby, as well as that a Diploma in Acoustics and Noise Control, and a BE from the National University of Ireland. Just a quick, quick uh, introduction to some of our clients throughout Ireland. Um, now that we got that out of the way, moving on then. Uh, the objectives from today's webinar. Okay, I plan to provide you with an insight into occupational noise, hand arm vibration and whole body vibration. As well as that, I'd like to introduce you to the relevant threshold values for noise, for hand arm vibration and whole body vibration. And also I'd like to explain how we carry out a hand arm vibration measurement. And as well as that, I also plan to show you how we carry out a whole body vibration measurement. Okay, so occupational noise and vibration. Well, this was originally set out in the Safety, Health and Welfare at Work uh, Control of Noise at Work Regulations 2006. Now, this was then superseded by um, uh, the following document. Um, so basically, um, this r replaced the, the 2007 um, we call it general application, re replace the 2006 uh, work regulations. Uh, particularly within that, there are two important parts that relate to this webinar. Uh, part 5, Chapter 1, deals with the control of noise at work, and Part 5, Chapter 2, deals specifically with the control of vibration at work. So let's look at some of the health effects of noise. Well, deafness will say the permanent loss of hearing arises from the continuous exposure to noise. And so this is a gradual process. So therefore, all of the controlling metrics, um, they use an eight hour exposure limit and, a, and indeed a weekly exposure limit. So it's based on the assumption that over time, long term exposure to noise or continuous exposure to noise will give rise to uh, hearing damage. There's also another to be considered, which is blast deafness. This is the permanent loss of hearing arising out of sudden exposure to high noise levels that may produce greater damage uh, to hearing. Um, and again, when measuring noise, occupational noise, you measure two parameters. You look at the um, a parameter called the LAEQ, uh, eight hour value, as well as an LC peak, which is a maximum level. So it's almost like a peak level, um, and that is monitored as part of the assessment process. So a little quick note on those short duration events. Um, an impulsive noise in excess of 150 dB would probably produce instantaneous damage, whereas noise in excess of 130 would be at the threshold of pain. So that's just to put, um, put those figures into context in relation to short-term short events or noise events. Okay, looking at the general applications then that I spoke of in the last couple of slides, 2007 on noise, this sets out exposure limit values and exposure action values. Now just to explain, during the daytime period there is an exposure limit value. So it's based on an eight hour exposure limit shall not exceed 87 dBA and the peak, P peak, which um, which is a C-weighted measurement, shall not exceed 140. Now, they are limit values. So in terms of your, say, for example, that you're specifying hearing protection, it must be designed uh, to ensure that those limit values are not exceeded. Um, and that's the basis of the exposure limit value. So it does consider uh, the use of hearing protection if absolutely necessary. Obviously, we should always try to design um, noise environments uh, that don't require the use of hearing protection, but in some cases it, it's not feasible to do that. Um, but basically there is a, a specific uh, exposure limit value that we need to work within. 
Also within the general applications 2007 guidance, there are what are called upper exposure action values and lower action exposure action values. So basically, depending on your noise climate and where it sits when examined or evaluated over an eight hour period, you could fall within a lower action value or you could involve you could fall within an upper action uh, value. Um, and in such cases, there is different uh, requirements. A lower action exposure action value, for example, is generally a lower noise environment. Uh, so there's a certain um, uh, number of requirements uh, required there for the employer. Whereas in upper action, upper exposure action values, there are generally um, more sort of uh, stringent conditions stipulated. So, so essentially, there's just three things to take away from that slide. One, that there is an exposure limit value, there's an upper exposure action value, and again, a lower exposure action value. Uh, this is a very useful uh, noise exposure calculator. It's produced by the Health and Safety Executive in the UK. Um, and in there, you'll find there are very useful um, Excel sheets that can be used to determine, we'll say, somebody's daily noise exposure or indeed their weekly noise exposure. So using measurements, once you know, once you've measured the noise source accurately using the proper instrumentation, you can work out uh, based on the number of hours spent, for example, on a specific machine, uh, you can work out what their likely daily exposure level is, or indeed their weekly exposure level uh, is. Now, there's also a useful Excel document there as well on hearing protection calculators, and that is based on measurements where you carry out an octave band measurement of the noise source, and using the hearing protection data, you can work out how much uh, protection is likely to be offered by that hearing protection. So again, they use um, use, an, use Excel, Microsoft Excel. And um, just we would uh, advise you to be cautious in terms of using these figures. The Excel sheets are correct from what we are aware, but they always should be checked by somebody who is um, qualified to do so. Okay, so the measurement of uh, occupational noise. There's two methods of doing it. It's a spot measurement uh, technique whereby uh, a noise consultant will move around a facility and carry out measurements in close proximity to the ear. Um, and that's termed the spot measurement method. There's also a method of using dose meters, which can, be, can give varying results. Um, dose meters are particularly useful if you are planning to monitor noise over very long periods of time. Um, dose meters, for example, are something that we would encourage most facilities to have so that they could build up historical data. Um, you should keep in mind, however, dose meters can be subject to, um, to inaccuracies. For example, they become measurement a uh, measurement technique. Uh, they're carried in the absence of um, they're carried around in the absence of any sort of supervisor, if you like. So they could be subject to, for example, they could be left in cloakrooms. Um, you know, you just don't know. They're an unattended measurement. So you're trying to determine the noise exposure, and you don't know much about where the employee has been, for example. Um, so again. Uh, spot measurement technique would be favoured in terms of uh, an operator being able to quantify what the employee was doing at that time or <clears throat> the machine that was being used and so on. So again, both um, both techniques can be used. Spot measurement is, in our view, the most accurate. Uh, dose meters can be used, uh, but again, um, they're something that I think you should use uh, on an ongoing basis and I wouldn't rely on them solely. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide then. So vibration. <clears throat> well, vibration can affect individuals in two ways. Um, the first way is that vibration generated in the hands and arms by powered hand tools, uh, we refer to that as hand arm vibration, or you'll see it written as HAV. The other vibration you need to be aware of is it's titled whole body vibration, and it's vibration passing through the body 
which is generated in site vehicles and agricultural vehicles, and that's known as whole body vibration. There's two types of vibration we're concerned with. So again, referring to the general application to 2007 on hand arm vibration and exposure limit values, the, that document specifies for hand arm vibration, for example, the daily exposure limit value standard standardized again to an eight hour reference period shall be five meters per second per second. Now that's a measurement of acceleration, um, that's vibration acceleration. And again, it is based on an eight hour reference period, similar to noise. Um, so for example, if you had a powered hand tool, um, you would be concerned with the, we we'll call it the trigger on time. Um, for example, if you take an individual using an orbital sander at a facility, it's unlikely that an operator, for example, will use that um, that particular piece of equipment for eight hours solid. Um, you, you're talking about work breaks, uh, rest periods, and so on. So again, it's based on the likely exposure over an eight hour period. And in some cases, that might be as low as five and six hours um, per day. So you need to keep that in mind. It's not, it, it, it relates to the on time of that equipment. So sometimes um, we would use for pneumatic tools, we, we use a, a trigger on time measurement device. So whenever the, the pneumatic tool is used, it starts the, it commences the, the clock, if you like. So you can work out exactly what the on time for that machine was for a, for a given operator over an eight hour reference period. Now again, there are limit values and, and the first item there we're looking at is item A, which is a daily uh, exposure limit value. And you'll notice there are also similar to noise, there are daily exposure action values. And again, you'll notice that the acceleration is lower for the action value. So as an employer, for example, you have certain requirements that you must carry out when you reach the uh, action value. So it initiates action um, or is a series of steps that an employer must take in order to protect the welfare of the employee. And again, um, there are action values and you'll notice that the exposure limit value that cannot be exceeded is that. Okay, so moving on then, um, looking uh, at whole body vibration at this time and back again to general applications uh, 2007. Um, you'll notice this is very similar. Um, it's again based on a daily exposure limit value standardized to an eight hour reference period and it shall be 1.15 meters per second per second. And again, you'll notice that that vibration level would be a lot, um, a lot lower than the hand arm vibration acceleration values. Um, and again, simply you're exposing the whole body if you like to this. So again, you'll notice that there are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, daily exposure limit values and of course uh, action values. So again, when you reach the action value, you'll generally reach an action value before you will the exposure limit value. Um, there are certain requirements for the employer. So they're similar um, when you consider noise, hand arm vibration and whole body vibration. They're based very much on uh, daily exp exposure limits and of course um, action values uh, in terms of the requirements for the employer. Okay, so let's look at some typical vibration magnitudes. Um, for hand arm vibration, for example, a chainsaw typically generates um, six meters per second per second in terms of its uh, acceleration. Um, this is an example of a hand sander, it generates uh, again uh, a higher acceleration. Um, again, a hammer drill and so on, and a road breaker. Um, that's where you, where an operator would be using a, a pneumatic um, road or a hydraulic uh, road breaker. Again, you'll notice the levels will be higher. So depending on the machine, uh, the, the piece of equipment, and of course, um, the task being carried out at that time will influence the um, hand arm vibration levels. Okay, so. Moving on then, uh, let's look at some typical examples of whole body vibration. Uh, one that would be common to us all, um, if you think of a car, for example, again, if you were to measure the level uh, when driving along on, on a typical road, um, you may 
you, you know you may come up with a figure something like that but again as i say a typical road you could depending very much on the surfaces of the road um the particular the vehicle and so on um those values will will vary considerably but these are just sort of examples of typical vibration magnitudes just to put them into context uh, for for you okay so moving on to the next slide um here are some examples of tools that generate hand iron vibration now this is a, a an angle grinder um and you'll notice there are two handles on it uh, there's a handle here and there's also a handle here so this operator's arm both hands both arms or both hands you say are exposed to hand iron vibration so in a case like this we would measure uh, the vibration magnitude on both handles um, now just in relation to angle grinders and um, similar equipment like that a lot of the leading manufacturers are putting a lot more design now into the actual handle and decoupling the handle from the machine in that it's still obviously connected to the machine for control purposes but there is vibration decoupling in there um, all in the in the interest of obviously protecting the employee and reducing the exposure to hand arm vibration uh, here's another example. Um, again, this is a masonry drill. Uh, well, it's got a, a breaking, um, it, like a chipping hammer almost on that. But in this particular application, um, I don't know if you can see that in the photograph, but um, here we have an accelerometer attached um, to the handle. So it's a small enough device, um, but you attach accelerometer onto the handle and it's in some cases tie wrapped onto the handle and the operator uses that machine and that's when you carry out your hand arm vibration measurement another example um typical this is, would be a pneumatic uh, rock breaker again um you're concerned about the man machine interface where the operator holds onto the machine and that's generally where you place your accelerometers in terms of measuring the amount of hand arm vibration okay so more tools generate hand arm vibration this is a chainsaw again you have a handle an operator holds a handle here and they're holding a, uh, another handle back here and again uh, each time that machine is used um, will generate hand arm vibration um, this is an example of a particular piece of uh, construction equipment uh, it's often called a whacker if you like um, used for leveling purposes but that machine uh, induces vibration into the handles if you like and here again we have an accelerometer attached onto the handles of that machine if you like um, and you can you know you, you, you this device if you like is carried by an operator uh, while you're carrying out that measurement but it's just resting there at the minute um, for the purposes of the photograph okay so Common sources again: the forestry sector. Um, forestry sector um, would be, uh, so we call it a high-risk category. Another high-risk ca category would be those working in the aviation sector, or indeed um, in any sort of, um, if you've got body shop applications, where you have operators using, you know, orbital sanders, for example, for long periods of time. You can see that operator, for example, will have his hand over this. Uh, pneumatic uh, orbital sander. Uh, he may be doing that for you know four, four five, six, seven hours a day. Um, so again, they're getting lots of vibration induced into the hand, hand, hand and arm. Um, again, uh, a lot of the manufacturers. This isn't an example of one, but um, again, you're always concerned with the handles. You're concerned where the operator holds the particular piece of equipment, and that's where you attach your accelerometers. Um, local authorities have a number of people in this, this type of an application where they're using these brush cutters um, and again they have um, they have their hands uh, firmly on a machine that's you know mechanically connected and there's a certain level of vibration that's induced into those handles um, all the time okay so moving on to the next slide then and uh, we're dealing specifically obviously with the measurement of hand arm vibration so this is a one particular application um, where this vibrating device is used to um, get rid of uh, air in concrete, if you like. Um, but it vibrates, if you like, and it induces vibration up into the hand. So again, 
uh, you'll, you'll notice there's an accelerometer attached here, for example, and a lead coming off that and back onto your device here where you can measure the uh, the amount of hand arm vibration. Now, again, um, this accelerometer is close to the source. Uh, I would suggest it would be probably better at that point where the operator is um, holds his, um, holds that device, if you like. So again, um, you need to be very careful as to where they are placed, uh, which is uh, critical. So <clears throat> why are we concerned about hand arm vibration? Well, workers that are affected by hand arm vibration, they, com they commonly report uh, the following. Um, they report attacks of whitening or blanching of one or more of the fingers when exposed to the cold. So this is something, this is a, an attack, we'll say, that comes on the hand. It's like a blanching effect um, that happens, but it only happens, um, or they start to notice it, if you like, when the hand becomes cold. Again, um, workers can report a tingling or a loss of sensation in their fingers. Um, also, there's some, some notes would suggest there's a, lot, a loss of light touch. So the sensitivity of the hand uh, can be affected by hand arm vibration. Um, many will report pain and cold sensations between periodic white finger attacks. So again, it can cause pain. Um, something that to keep in mind. And another factor can be a loss of grip strength, where you lose your ability to hold something. Um, and that would be in very severe cases. But these are all just known health effects. Now, I wouldn't be qualified to make any comment on health effects, but we, we do measure in accordance with the guidance values. And um, that, that's essentially, I suppose, our area of expertise. But again, the health effects, these are just known health effects um, that I'm reproducing here that might be of use. Okay, so again, the last one there is bone cysts in fingers and wrists. Again, it's not my specific area, so I won't go into it in much detail. Um, this is what I understand um, as are some of the symptoms of uh, vibration, white finger. Again, I understand that it, it, it's a sort of a, a blanching effect that you'll get on fingers. Um, it's quite obvious in these photographs, but that is what I understand to be an example of a, a vibration white finger. Okay, so we can, like the noise earlier on, um, I explained that the uh, health and safety executive in the UK, um, are, they're quite progressive and they provide, um, they provide some useful documentation on the control of and the risks of hand arm vibration. Um, they also provide a guide to using their hand arm vibration calculator and they have a calculator in Excel, again, where you can measure the vibration level uh, of, of, a, of a given hand tool, for example, and work out uh, based on the time on that machine, what the daily and weekly exposure values are and see where it sits in relation to the um, exposure levels and the limiting values and indeed the um, the upper uh, the the exposure values and the limiting values for that day okay so again when you're measuring hand arm vibration it's important that you follow a standard and the standard that's used for that is BS uh, EN ISO 5349 and again going back to um, the specifics as to where the accelerometer should be placed. Um, this standard sets out actual axes um, where you need to be measuring. You're measuring typically, um, you're measuring in three axes um, in terms of your, your handle or the handle of the device that you're testing. Um, now, it is important to note that there is a weighting correction that is applied to these measurements. So the instrumentation that we use um, has a weighting correction, if you like. So it is, it's a weighted acceleration. So it's, it's like that the, while we use an accelerometer, we're not measuring um, the linear acceleration. We are measuring a weighted acceleration that has been corrected to represent um, how vibration affects or the sensitivity of the hand and the hand and arm to vibration in certain axes. So again, what is important, it's a weighted acceleration. 
Um, again, we measure it on all handles, not just one handle, any contact point, any human or man machine interface point um, will need to be assessed. So it's two handles in the case of two equipment that's used by, by, with two hands. Um, again, we measure in all three orthogonal axes. Um, again, the standard does specify where they are. It gives you an X. An X, you'll notice, is in this direction. Um, you'll have a Y, a Y, a Y, and then, uh, which is, we can't see it on this particular drawing, but, and then you have a Z. So it gives you, it gives you, um, it specifies exactly where those axes are. You'll see the Y, sorry, the Y axis is along here. Okay, and again, um, what happens then is you, you take those measurements on the three axes. So the accelerometer that you use has to be able to measure in three separate axes. And then it takes the, that information, if you like, and it works out uh, the vector sum of those three uh, vibration levels in the three axes. And that's how you, you determine your vibration level for the hand arm uh, assessment process. Okay, so a couple of control measures then for hand. Okay, so um, let's look at um, uh, some control measures. Um, we can carry out a, a risk assessment, we'll say, to evaluate the potential exposure of employees to hand hour vibration. And that in its own right is a control measure. Um, you can look at alternative methods to be used. For example, is what you're using, um, for example, is, is, is the method you're using the best method? Are there alternative methods? Uh, does it does the the process require um, the human interface, if you like? Is there another or a better way of doing it um, that can reduce the exposure to employees? Um, the other thing that would be recommended is that you carry out pre-employment health assessments. Um, that would be to determine if somebody already has had exposure to hand down vibration and may have symptoms already there. Um, that you should know about um, and avoid, obviously, if somebody was had, had exposure to this in the past, perhaps um, you, you wouldn't worsen the situation by exposing them to vibration um, on a daily basis. Um, one other method is to in introduce job rotation to minimize exposure. So if there is a particular job to be done, uh, rotate employees so that their exposure time is minimized. Maybe, for example, in the event of um, an employee using an orbital sander, for example, that that would be limited to, say, two hours a day and so on. Or, or for example, that it would be rotated between you know two or three employees, again, minimizing exposure. Uh, by sharing it with, say, over three or four employees. Uh, another, another important thing would be, obviously, to consult with tool manufacturers and suppliers, higher companies. Is it possible, for example, to um, source low vibration tools? As I said to you earlier on, a lot of the market leaders are developing improved technologies where the handles are, you know, there's better decoupling between the tool and the actual handle. And in such cases, um, it reduces employee exposure to vibration. Um, and again, uh, as I say, treat manufacturers. How you go, if this is an important note. Um, you need to be careful when you see a machine advertised as a low vibration machine. Um, in order to get that, uh, uh, it's not a classification, but it's something that uh, a manufacturer may advertise, for example, a low vibration machine. This could be a low vibration of a machine of a, of a prior machine that they had. So you need to really know what kind of vibration levels that they produce. So I would just advise you to treat manufacturers and uh, higher companies' vibration ratings with a little bit of caution. Um, it may be a lower vibration machine than a previous machine that they had, but it doesn't necessarily suggest that it's not going to cause damage or injury. So just keep that in mind. Um, some of the control measures then for hand arm vibration. Um, check out databases. There are um, databases available where tools are giving a rating. Um, again, you need to be sure that the da data available is uh, relevant and accurate, but it is something that is uh, emerging 
where they're starting to classify tools um, and specify makes and models and the likely vibration level. Now keep in mind, the it depends very much on what the tool is doing. For example, if you're using that hand tool to cut something that's rough um, and difficult, uh, it might induce a much higher vibration level than if you were cutting something that was soft and easier to, to machine. So again, there can be variation in the process, so you need to be mindful of that as well. Um, the other thing is obviously to brief all employees on the risk and dangers um, associated with hand arm vibration, uh, which will be important. Um, and it is also suggested in the guidance that you would initiate weekly skin checks. Um, that is a detailed, we'll say, control measure. Um, and again, with as with any sort of health risks, uh, it does recommend that uh, you would introduce periodic health surveillance uh, checks as well. Um, one thing that is important um, would be when people are using uh, vibrating equipment would be to keep the hands warm and to main, maintain circulation. Um, so in some cases where there is a lot of vibration, even though gloves don't actually are not that effective in terms of reducing vibration. Um, they do keep the hands warm and they do maintain circulation. And again, um, these are all guidance uh, or control measures that that are are suggested in the guidance documents, um, and not something that we've put together. But uh, I'm just reproducing them here so that you have um, you have a record of them. Okay, so moving on then to whole body vibration. Well, these are examples of machines or equipment that can give rise to whole body vibration. Again, this is a vibratory roller um, where you may have an operator sitting on that machine for long periods of time throughout a day. Um, that machine in its own right, while it rolls, it also vibrates. Um, and as a result, you can have an operator sitting on the machine and vibration will be induced into the seat and into that operator. Um, so again, um, an operator can be exposed to whole body vibration on a machine like that. Um, again, forestry equipment, um, you could have an operator inside that cab that's exposed to vibration throughout a day. Um, this is a more common example. Um, local authorities may have employees on um, the likes of gardening equipment, um, but you, you could have an operator sitting on a, on a machine like that for six hours a day uh, with something, I suppose, grass cutting, if you like, and uh, as a result, there's vibration being induced into the body throughout the day as they carry out the work. And another good example would be um, buses. Um, some of these older buses uh, used by Dublin Bus, um, they may not have um, I'm not suggesting that the Dublin bus don't have, but it, it's something to keep in mind that um, perhaps uh, whole body vibration should be considered with, in relation to um, the types of seats provided in these uh, for drivers that are, you know, doing a lot of city driving, if you like, um, sometimes on quite rough uh, street surfaces and you get vibration induced into the body. Um, so again, it's something that should be checked and monitored. Um, and then, of course, forklift drivers. Again, you could have somebody in a warehouse, um, you know, moving equipment, sitting in a, in a machine like that all day, uh, exposed to vibration, uh, depending very much on the surface, of course, um, and the likely work carried out. Okay, so again, uh, some health effects of chronic uh, vibration. Um, lower back pain, for example, can be caused by whole body vibration or lots of exposure to whole body vibration. Uh, you can also get neck and shoulder disorders arising from uh, long-term exposure to whole body vibration. Um, you can also get digestive and circulatory disorders. Um, and these again, as I said, these are within all the guidance documents. These are what they suggest um, are the health effects. Um, others are with we'll insomnia, headaches, shakiness shortly after or during exposure. And these are just something, you know, there's that, that's information that we have taken from guidance value, from guidance documents uh, in terms of the reported effects of, we'd say, chronic, uh, chronic vibration. Okay, so going on to the measurement then of whole body vibration. <clears throat> well, this is um, our equipment in place in a bus, for example. Um, and again, 
we're measuring in specific axes inside in this uh, device is an accelerometer and it's measuring vertically you know and horizontally and there's the x in the y direction and the z direction is vertically so again when you're measuring that there is the the instrumentation has weightings applied to all of these axes so it corrects um, for the human body's susceptibility to vibration for example in the vertical um, as opposed to the horizontal those the x and the y axis so that is important and it's an important element of the measurement process <clears throat> again this is the lower part of that seat so if you can imagine um as that that bus if you like travels we say or throughout the city um the bus the floor the, the base of the bus is vibrating and inducing that um up through that post if you like um so so the driver is getting a certain amount of vertical um vibration and of course he's getting vibration in the x and the y axis as well so when we're measuring it then and um, this is some of the instrumentation that we would use to measure it um, the instrument will report back to us the measurement in the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis, and it works out uh, vibration levels um, again based on the vector sum I discussed earlier on. Um, but it'll work that out for the uh, operator, and it's something that you would measure over a period of time. So you're interested in the operator's exposure throughout a daytime period, but you need to take sort of representative samples. And in this particular example. You know, you're only 43 minutes into the measurement. So again, it needs to be representative of what the operator is likely to be exposed to. Again, the um, the health service and safety executive in the UK have provided very good guidance on this, um, and as well as that, they also have vibration calculators. Um, the health and safety authority in Ireland uh, also have um, some information in terms of the, we say the uh, general applications regulations of 2007 and again is uh, that chapter 2 of part 5 deals specifically with the control of vibration at work that's a useful document um, so again um, good opportunity for the health and safety authority here in Ireland would be to provide uh, some more information I think on uh, hand iron vibration and whole body vibration um, <clears throat> there is a limited amount of information available um, when you compare it with what's available in the UK but that's something that I think will come in time and um, one thing to keep in mind we note in the UK that there are legal companies specializing in hand iron vibration claims this is an example of one such solicitors they um, they offer this as a specialist service um, they deal with all sorts of um, claims if you like but this is an example of one uh, that deals specifically with the um, hand arm vibration um, again in terms of hand arm vibration um, there is a, a method called the Stockholm scale that deals with the severity of um, a hand arm vibration claim uh, depending on how bad the um, the effect is or the if you like the if, you, if you're suffering for example from uh, blanching in the fingers you can quantify and um, calculate the severity of the damage um, using this Stockholm scale so just that I'd mention it um, it is there is a I suppose a recognized method of determining um, how how bad or how how affected you are by hand arm vibration okay so moving on then um, there is also companies that, um, that specialize, of course, in whole body vibration claims. Again, um, this particular legal firm that says, you know, whole body vibration syndrome. So they, they, they talk about these, this in detail. They have a speciality in this area. And again, uh, this is something that's fairly widespread in the UK. Um, not so much here, but it's certainly something to, to consider. Okay, so the next steps, we have two very good guidance documents from the UK on hand arm vibration and on whole body vibration. And if you'd like a copy of those, if you just email me at dearmouth at acoustics.ie. And of course, if you have any project specifically that you'd like to uh, us to look at, uh, please feel free to get in touch. Okay, so that um, almost concludes it. <laughs> uh, just some successful hand arm vibration claims in the UK. I'll just um, deal with these very quickly. Uh, British Gas 
fitter uh, got a compensation of 143,000 um, in terms of uh, one uh, hand arm vibration claim. Uh, here is another example. Um, there was a claim for £200,000 uh, to a tree surgeon employed by Liverpool City Council, uh, which was another successful hand arm vibration claim. Um, so I just put up a couple of examples of different um, different cases there, which I think are important uh, in that uh, this is something that that needs to be addressed, um, and there is there's a facility there to carry out risk assessments, to measure, to quantify it, and to make recommendation if action needs to be taken, and which would certainly avoid um, claims here in Ireland and indeed in the UK and on a worldwide basis also. Okay, so also there's plenty of examples of whole body vibration claims. I just took this one, for example, where 1.9 million was awarded to a train driver for whole body vibration. And that's another uh, high risk uh, activity, if you like, where you might have you know, a train driver standing for long periods of time or indeed seated. Um, so you can measure the exposure to vibration in the standing or in the seated arrangement. Uh, so it is an, an important um, factor. So thank you for your time. As I say, um, my contact details, I'll leave them on screen there. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to text them through and I'll try and answer them for you. Thank you for your time.